This was promotion for a, uh, a book I'd done uh, called Growing Up. Uh, I had reached the stage where I'd do anything for publicity, including sitting in a tin can. <laughs> I'd always been interested in writing, you know, went, went back to childhood. It looked easy, that's why. I was, I'm very lazy, and uh, writing looked like an easy way to make a living. And I was, thought it was great fun writing. You know, it was a way of, uh, way of asserting your superiority when I had nothing else to feel superior about. <laughs> <laughs> to be a columnist on the New York Times involved all sorts of uh, indulgences. You worked, uh, I worked directly for the publisher at the Times. Uh, reported to him. I didn't have an editorial boss. I'd done a lot of, done about everything you could do in journalism and I was a little tired and I came to Virginia where I was born. It was my home, home grounds. I was born just uh, 12 miles up the road from Leesburg here. It was like coming home. I couldn't think of a place more beautiful in this part of Virginia. Uh, this part of the house is very old. It was uh, built around 1810, my son thinks. The other side, it's, this is two houses put together. This was built after the Civil War. You'll notice every floor is uh, elevated or down. They built one room at a time. And in this, this part of the house was obviously where uh, you can tell that people were much shorter in those days than they are now. Because if I try to get out of here standing up, I'm going to brain myself. In the office, like everything else, it's another step down and keep your head down because I think people must have been only three feet high when they built this. There's a poster from my days as the host of Masterpiece Theater. Uh, Noisemakers. Here's an antique uh, turntable. I can't stand apart with it because I've got all these old records, some of them 60 years old and they won't play on any modern equipment. Pulitzer Prizes, they give you a certificate, or they did in those days. There were strong men in the Senate. It was a much different body than it is now. It's a very inferior group of people now. Not long ago, they had a senator, the guy from Mississippi, who quit, gave up his Senate seat to be a lobbyist. When I covered the Senate, if anybody had done that, he might have been lynched. Well, now it's, uh, what is the Senate? It's nothing. It's sort of farcical. I think everybody has contempt for it. When do you think that tide changed? It was slowly. It's a slow process. It has to do with money, you know, one, for one thing, and the changing nature of America and the foreign policy. The Senate was very, a very uh, integral part of foreign policy mm -hmm. uh, after, all through World War II and long afterwards, up, up through Kennedy's time and Johnson's time. Mm -hmm. But with, beginning with Vietnam and then with Watergate, uh, everything seemed to fall to pieces. Mm -hmm. The Vietnam War didn't break out. It was like a long simmering uh, latent disease that the country refused to recognize. It was suffering, uh, like an awful cancer that was submerged. And, and finally, in 1968, it exploded. It became acute. American casualties in Vietnam had become obvious. The injustice of the war, the, uh, the people they were drafting, the draft dodgers, uh, were not going. Uh, the poor people were going, and they were being killed in uh, in significant numbers, enough to alarm a lot of people politically, which uh, finally exploded into the Democratic Convention of 1968 in Chicago, which turned into a riot. And it was a sim plain and simply a riot. Police beating people in the street, throwing people through plate glass windows. Uh, uh, I mean, it was, a, it was the real thing. Bobby was killed in uh, Los Angeles and I was in Washington. I remember waking up to hear on the radio, morning news on the radio. He'd been shot. Uh, King, the King thing was really awful. And 
this is, has to do with the imperial evolution of the, the American government, uh, this great military establishment. You can't stop it. You just can't stop it anymore from going to wherever the war is. But if you, uh, if somebody said, well, let's draft people, you'd immediately, <laughs> there'd be no war. <laughs> see? The Americans don't really support it. Uh, you're going to raise taxes to pay for it? No. Oh. <laughs> the technology was inevitably going to change everything. It has. Where you have constant contact, everybody in constant contact about everything. I mean, some of the stuff that you know, people are now tweeting, is that the right word? Uh, uh, they're reporting on their bowel movements and so forth. Everything is known to everybody. Uh, I don't understand Google, except, uh, you know, when I want a piece of information, I, I do what everybody does. I turn to Google or whoever is going, and I really don't know uh, how it works. How do they do that? <laughs> Can I trust what they give me? I don't know. Probably. You know, I'm looking for a statistic. When did Thomas Hardy die? You know, Google will tell me that instantly. I don't have to get up and go to the library and take a book off the shelf anymore. It was the depression. Right. And people say, what are all these homeless people going to do now uh, that we have at present? And the answer in 1931 was you went and lived with a relative. Mm -hmm. What's Robert Frost say? Uh, home is where when you go there, they got to let you in. <laughs>